And it's Wednesday. And yeah. <laughs> it's Wednesday. <laughs> and I'm Wednesday. <laughs> Are we going, Jeff? No, but you're live. Okay, we're live. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. They can't hear us, so it's fine. Keep the volume down. <laughs> Nick. No, no, you're on TV. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. No, your voice, even now. <laughs> he would turn the mics down. We're going to do it live. Turn it down. Oh, we should start now, you're saying? You're this is 5 on 20 <laughs> News with Luke Goodhart. <laughs> Ty Bash. It's Wednesday, April 26th, and we're coming to you live from the Creative Tucson studio here in downtown Tucson, so let's talk about local headlines, shall we? Pull it together, Ty. <laughs> A former top spokeswoman for the Arizona Republican Party was paid for two months while she was working on the Trump campaign rather than the state. Stephanie Grisham, who is now a White House staffer, worked on Trump's thank you tour after the election, but was paid by Arizona, according to the Arizona Capital Times. She began working on the campaign in May of 2016 after the legislature finished for the session. She then worked on Trump's transition team, later becoming deputy press secretary. Since Trump was elected, Grisham served as special assistant to the president and was later named director of communications for First Lady Melania Trump. The Capital Times reported that she was paid about $19,000 from the state of Arizona at the end of 2016 and beginning of 2017. This was even though Grisham rarely set foot in the state, never showed up for work in the House, and did little to nothing to earn the money, according to the report. Grisham had initially taken an unpaid leave from the House, but then House Speaker David Gowan put her back on the payroll for his last eight weeks in office. This is a common problem in the Arizona House, as staffers often let the clock run out for lame duck leaders like Gowan. While staffers stay on the payroll, they rarely do any work, but are still able to collect a paycheck. The Capital Times report found that Grisham hadn't even sent an email from her House account in the final two months. However, in this, Grisham was still able to accomplish about the same amount as Congress over that time. As a result, the Arizona legislature has proposed taking a year paid break as a governing experiment. If all goes well, our entire legislature will end up as part of the Trump administration. Yay! The Arizona Senate advanced legislation yesterday that would change the rules and qualifications for becoming a teacher in the state. Senate Bill 1042 would allow teachers to obtain a subject matter ex expert standard teaching certificate um, to be eligible to teach in the school. This would bypass the state's regular requirements to earn a basic teaching certificate. It requires candidates to have taught relevant courses for the last two consecutive years and for at least three years at an accredited college level institution. The candidate would also need an academic degree in the subject or demonstrate expertise throughout at least five years of work in the field, which is good, I agree with that. The easing of rules was pushed by Governor Doug Ducey as part of the education initiative. He spelled out in his January State of the State address. At the event, he said that qualified professionals need to gain easier access into the classroom and Ducey made no mystery of support on Twitter. Yesterday, Ducey tweeted, and I quote, let's reform te teacher certification and get more teachers in AZ classrooms. He then tweeted again, but must have been a little excited or perhaps tipsy because he tweeted, sent it my way, exclamation mark, unquote, but probably meant to say, send it my way, which would have made more sense, but. However, Arizona Democrats are not as excited as Ducey about the proposed changes. Democratic Senator Steve Farley said that changes to uh, certification would not solve the problem and would lower the standards of Arizona teachers. He also said that these less qualified teachers are more likely to leave the position after a few years, which is already a problem in the state right now. Ducey said that if the plan doesn't work, then he'll continue to ease the certification system by eliminating background checks and requiring, requiring only a pulse. But even that, he says, is negotiable. Wow, it's, I'm so glad we have all these negotiators in government. <laughs> Citizens of Phoenix will soon be able to order a self-driving car with a mobile app. Waymo, a company spun off of Google's Alphabet, will launch the next phase of its testing of the autonomous vehicles, according to an announcement yesterday. Waymo has logged millions of miles in various cities over the years and chose the Phoenix, San Francisco, Seattle, and Austin areas as its first testing grounds. They're offering the use of their self-driving Chrysler minivans and Lexuses to a small group of chosen participants. If chosen, people will be able to summon the car with a mobile app, and they're encouraged to go places where they would go normally. 
Those chosen for the program will not have to pay for the service since it is a test. The company will add 500 vehicles to its autonomous fleet, up from 100, which is what they have currently. Only residents of Chandler, Mesa, Tempe, and Gilbert qualify for the program, but if you live in or have family that live in any of these areas and want to be terrified out of your mind by a self-driving car, visit the Waymo website at www.waymo.com apply to complete the application. After completion, your robot car will pick you up at your door and you will never be heard from again. Waymo. You know, I wonder, depending on the timeline, would you, can you sign up for both Waymo and NASA, like to go to Mars? You think you could do both? Just you have like to probably Kesha, choose. I need a twelve fifty launch to Mars. <laughs> yeah. Can't make it to the launch. <laughs> Sorry, like gotta do Waymo first. I'll be here in three days. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, wow. So the future is so exciting. Three schools in Arizona made the list of best schools in the nation, according to the U.S. News and World Report magazine. All three schools were part of the Basis B A S I S system, and included Basis schools in Scottsdale, Tucson, and Oro Valley. And if the list were expanded to the top 15, three additional schools would be placed from Arizona, including BASIS, or B-A-S-I-S, schools in Peoria, Chandler, and Chandler, sorry, those, only those two, which placed fifth and seventh on the list. University High School in Tucson also placed 15th. Kristen Jordanson, head of Scottsdale BASIS, or B-A-S-I-S, said that the school has succeeded because its teachers are successful in their fields of study, which include being physicists, biologists, chemists. Students at Scottsdale Basis, or BASIS, must complete at least eight AP courses and pass six AP exams to graduate. Wow, I wouldn't have graduated high school. The school also offers over 70 clubs and other extracurricular activities to students, which is great. It's really good to hear. Governor Ducey, here he is again, said that these rankings bring attention to the educational excellence happening in Arizona. Once he was asked on the, once he was asked on the state of other schools in Arizona, Ducey promptly ended the press conference by exiting through a trap door. Great guy. Speaking of Governor Ducey again, <laughs> legislation was delivered to him somewhere in that pit he disappeared to after that <laughs> trap door escape that will extend the voting registration deadline. The deadline caused chaos in the last election when Secretary of State Michelle Reagan set the day on Columbus Day and refused to move it. Democrats railed against the decision because mail isn't delivered on Columbus Day and state motor vehicle offices were closed. Senate Bill 1307, introduced by Republican John Kavanaugh, passed both the Senate and the House unanimously and would add an extra day to the deadline if it falls on a holiday. Reagan initially claimed that the state didn't allow her to move the deadline. However, former Secretary of State Ken Bennett had moved the registration date in 2012 by one day. Then Reagan's spokesman said that she disagreed with the policy because she believed it to be illegal. The spokesman also said that Reagan believes that riding a recumbent bike and knowing all the words to Ignition Remix are also illegal. This is the re oh man, memories. Um, <laughs> wow. Law enforcement agencies in Arizona are desperately looking for new recruits for what they call critical job vacancies. Arizona law enforcement leaders, including Maricopa Sheriff Paul Penzoni, gathered for a press conference on Monday where they talked about the staffing shortages. Penzoni or Penzone? Is it Penzoni or Penzone? Penzone. Penzone. I think Penzoni said it that the departments are not looking for individuals who want a job, but rather those who want a career. Hmm. Arizona Department of Public Safety Director Colonel Frank Milstead also attended and said there is a shortage of both sworn officers and civilian professional staff. Phoenix Police Commander Brian Lee said his department is in the middle of an aggressive hiring campaign. Good for them. Very aggressive. Lee said, that, quote, police officers aren't born, they apply. <laughs> wow. Lee added, except for Robocop, he was created in a lab. And I guess the kid from Robocop and a half, he was born to be a cop. But you get what I mean. <laughs> that was all a quote, by the way. <laughs> Take a moment to talk about the program you're watching right now. Here at 5 on 20, we are undertaking a new kind of citizen journalism. We are going to give you the news as we see it, and we want more people to speak up with us. We need writers, hosts, anchors, camera people, sound people, the whole gamut. The times require a new way of informing ourselves, so join us. 
do it. Do it now. <laughs> Email us at info at creativetucson.org to get involved. And if you think there's a story we're missing, a person we should interview, an upcoming event we should cover, or have any news tips for us, shoot an email to info at creativetucson.org. We are here for you, and we want to cover all stories from all points of view. So don't be strangers. Now in national and international news. Before, actually, I heard if you do uh, become a member of Creative Tucson, you get a self-driving car. That's what I heard, though. Could be untrue. Um, a federal judge blocked an order by the Trump administration to cut off funding for so-called sanctuary cities. I should have done that. Um, a lawsuit was uh, filed first by San Francisco, then by Santa Clara, both in California. U.S. District Judge William Oreck of California ruled that the plaintiffs will likely succeed in the case because the, quote, balance of harms and public interests weigh in their favor, unquote. Sanctuary cities in the name is the name, sorry, given to cities that vowed to protect the nation's 11 million undocumented immigrants against federal enforcement. Trump said that by disobeying federal law, these cities shouldn't receive federal funding. However, sanctuary cities such as Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, noticing something, the big ones, claim that Trump is over budget, overburdening law, local law enforcement and that they have no obligation to enforce immigration law, which they say is a federal issue. The decision came days after the Department of Justice sent, nine, sent letters to nine jurisdictions threatening to block funding if they continued to not cooperate with federal immigration enforcement. San Francisco argued that they have 1.2 billion federal dollars at stake if the Justice Department delivers on their threats. While there is no strict definition of a sanctuary city, one study said that 39 cities and more than 360 counties would qualify for the label and would risk their federal funding. San Francisco City Attorney Dennis Herrera said that, quote, this is why we have courts, to halt the overreach of a president and an attorney general who either don't understand the Constitution or choose to ignore it, unquote. Thank you for that. In the decision, Judge Oreck said that San Francisco's sanctuary law is designed to, quote, ensure community security and, quote, due process for all, unquote. He said that federal funding is used to provide vital services such as a medical care, or such as medical care, social services, and meals to vulnerable residents, along with fixing up roads and providing public transportation. The White House has not yet responded to the ruling, but we can expect a grammatically questionable tweet any minute now. Great job, Joe. On fire. The U.S. is concerned about <laughs> Turkish airstrikes in Syria and Iraq launched against ethnic Kurds. About two dozen Kurds were killed in the airstrikes on Tuesday. The Kurds were mostly members of the U.S.-backed Popular Protections Unit, or YPG in Kurdish, who have been helping the U.S. to fight against ISIS in both Syria and Iraq. Turkey considers the YPG a terrorist group and has linked them to other separatist groups. However, members of the Iraqi Kurdish Peshmerga, who are friendly to Turkey, were also killed in the attacks. The Iraqi government condemned the attacks as violating their national sovereignty. Mark Toner, a State Department spokesman, said the U.S. is, quote, deeply concerned that strikes were launched without proper coordination, either with U.S. forces or the international coalition to battle ISIS. But Turkish President Recep Erdogan defended the strikes, saying that, quote, we are obliged to take measures. He claimed that the Turkish military alerted the U.S. and Russia about the strikes and shared information with Iraqi and Kurdish President Masoud Barzani. Erdogan, however, did express regret over the killing of the Peshmerga members, saying the attack was not meant to target them. The strikes show that Syria and Iraq are essentially a free-for-all, with U.S., Russian, and Turkish military forces using the country for their playground for dropping bombs. The situation has gotten so complicated that no one appears to know whose side each country is fighting for. The U.S. is battling both the central government of Bashar al-Assad, along with the militants who are fighting against Assad. Assad is fighting alongside Russia and Turkey and battling both the U.S., ISIS, and Kurdish forces. Next week, Australia will join the fray, bringing along their tag team partner, New Zealand. The Undertaker and John Senna will soon join after the fight, battling on the side of the Russo-Australian alliance, who will give their allegiance to Lord Tusk. Wow, do we have a graphic for that? That was a lot of like, <laughs> we need to build a web you know, to explain <laughs> it's that. It's like a game of risk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the president, it's Trump, if you didn't know, um, has pissed off nearly every country in the world so far at this point. So it kind of makes sense that he's now settling, or se sorry, setting his sights on our friendly neighbor to the north, to the north. Up, yeah, up six. The Trump administration established a 24% tariff on Canadian lumber yesterday. A move intended to protect U.S. interests, of course. All the moves are. Canadian lumber makes about 30% of the U.S. market. However, 
The National Association of Home Builders, or the NAOHB, or just NAHB, claims that the tariff will only end up hurting new home buyers, which who will now face increased cost due to move expensive building materials. Yeah, wow, never thought that would be a thing. The group said that home builders will have $3,000 in higher cost due to the tariff, a cost that will be, pa will be passed on to the home buyers. Builders also say that the cost could cost the construction industry 8,000 jobs and 500 billion in lost wages. Good move. And Canadian producers say that even with the tariffs, the lumber will still be the cheaper than the US lumber and that they will still have to rely on Canada for its needs. So this is working out really well for us, it seems. US lumber manufacturers lobbied for the rule because they say that the Canadian government provides unfair subsidies to the lumber industry. Mm. The US Lumber Association, or the USLA, said the move isn't necessary to protect jobs, um, the 360,000 jobs in the industry, and that the additional costs of housing won't be as significant as claimed. Canadian officials say that if the U.S. continues these types of aggressive tariffs, they may be forced to write a stern letter that may not even have a friendly greeting. Jeez, Trump, settle down. <laughs> the Trump administration decided to back off their plan to demand border wall funding as a condition to pass a federal spending plan on Friday. But it looks like the big, beautiful wall is facing some more big, beautiful problems ahead. Mexican officials claim that building a wall along the Rio Grande River violates a 47-year-old treaty intended to protect shared waters between the two countries. If the treaty is violated, the case could end up in an international court. Antonio Rascón, a chief Mexican engineer on the International Boundary of Water Commission, says that the border wall could violate the treaty and that Mexico will not stand for it. The 1970 Boundary Treaty establishes an exact border between the U.S. and Mexico and sets rules for the riverside regions. It says that both sides must agree if there is to be a structure built that would affect the flow of the Rio Grande. The U.S. has already built over 700 miles of fencing along the border regardless of opposition from the Mexican government since 1992. The two sides have been able to work it out diplomatically over the years, but Trump's border wall is creating new tensions. To protest the wall, Mexican officials will first lodge a complaint with the U.S. If the complaint is not resolved, then it goes to the State Department and its Mexican counterpart. If that doesn't settle the dispute, the case will move on to an international court who will finally decide the matter. Mexican officials say that building a wall near the river will end up working as a dam and will put communities at risk for flooding. Their claims have already occurred in some cases, such as mass flooding in Nogales in 2008 and 2014, and flooding in the Oregon Pipe National Monument, which stretches across the border. They expect even worse flooding if the wall goes up in the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, which is known as a favorite crossing point for smugglers of drugs and people. Border Patrol Chief Ron Vidiello says that his agency won't strong-arm the Mexican government and that they will comply with their responsibilities of the treaty. But this means the wall will be constructed within 100 yards of the river. Mexican officials fear that this will create intense flooding in the case of a hurricane coming from the Gulf of Mexico. In response, the Trump administration will send hundreds of rubber dinghies to the Rio Grande area along with a pile of old raincoats. So, yeah, nice guy. Very caring, very understanding. The Cherokee Nation is suing a group of pharmacies for enabling an opiate crisis among the tribe in Oklahoma. Tribal leaders say that pharmacies, including Walgreens, Walmart, and CVS, the big ones, are flooding communities with prescription painkillers that are leading to the deaths of hundreds of tribal members. Todd Hembury, I think I said that right, attorney general for the Cherokee Nation, said that pharmacies are not doing enough to prevent painkillers from entering the black market, including powerful drugs such as Oxycontin and Vicodin. Walgreens, Walmart, and CVS are all named in the suit, along with pharmaceutical distributors like Amerisource Bergen, McKesson, and Cardinal Health. These companies act as middlemen between drug producers and pharmacies and distribute 85 to 90 percent of the prescription painkillers in the U.S. We used to just call them drug dealers. A representative from Cardinal Health said that the suit was a quote, mischaracterization of facts and misunderstanding of the law. They said that the opiate uh, epidemic was driven by addiction and high demand. However, the tribe claims that these companies often filled large suspicious prescriptions without questioning or without question in the 14 Cherokee counties in Oklahoma. The state is home to 177,000 tribe members and leads the county or country, sorry, in opiate abuse. 
Nearly a third of the, the, the prescription painkillers went to the Cherokee Nation. This is just one of several cases of cities and towns going after pharmaceutical distributors to try and stem the opioid crisis. The city of Everett, Washington, also sued Purdue Pharmaceuticals, the makers of OxyContin, claiming that they saturated the black market with their drugs. Nationwide, native populations have the highest rate of opiate addiction and drug-induced deaths, with OxyContin use among high school being twice the nation average. Babies are often born on the reservations addicted to drugs and spend their first months going through withdrawals. Studies claim that the drug addiction rates are caused by cultural destruction occurring over the past 200 years. It appears that the Cherokee have, not, have never forgotten over their, or never gotten over the, sorry, their forced removal in the 19th century and that trauma is remembered in their DNA. But other than that, the tribes have been treated wonderfully in the U.S. as you might know. Hmm. Not really. <laughs> a coal mining industry group voted yesterday to press the Trump administration to pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement after being pressured by the EPA. Normally, industry is the one pressuring the EPA, but this is Trump's America, which is kind of like Yakov Smirnov's Soviet Russia. EPA Chief Scott Pruitt met with leaders of the National Mining Association to express his concerns with the Paris Agreement according to Politico. Some coal companies have actually been open about staying in the agreement, which would be the largest global attempt to cut emissions and stave off the effects of climate change. This may be why Pruitt felt the need to lobby the coal industry, because if he can't get coal to back a withdrawal, then the Paris Agreement would likely remain. On Thursday, advisors from the Trump administration met to discuss their disagreements over the deal. On one side, Jared Kushner and Secretary of State Rex Tillerson believe that the U.S. should not isolate itself by pulling out of the climate deal. On the other side, Steve Bannon and Scott Pruitt feel that the U.S. should pull out of the deal because they either think it will impact industry or that climate change is a hoax. But Bannon and Pruitt both believe that the Earth has been around long enough and that we better start colonizing Mars. Bannon has even described a plan to be roommates with Pruitt on Mars and how he'll be able to get all those alien women who are into guys with cirrhosis. Well, see, I brought that up, though. So, so can he not sign up for Whammo? It's, it's becoming an issue. Maybe we should get him, in that, uh, get him that app. Yeah, we should get him on Whammo first and then worry about Mars later, because Whammo needs to be first. Anyways, it isn't only Starbucks where you can find a unicorn these days, yay. A farmer in Iceland is gaining some local fame for his sheep that looks like the mythical animal. Erla Pori Olasvaturter, I don't know how to say that, it's an Iceland name. Okay. Yep, Olasvaturter, uh, his sheep was born with fused horns, so it kind of looks like one giant horn, the primary feature of, of course, the unicorn. The Iceland Monitor reported that the sheep was left on the top of a mountain when other sheep were rounded up for the winter. Farmers spotted him on Christmas and weren't sure what it was. It has to be a unicorn. Erla, the farmer, said that the sheep's horn stretched its face and it looks like a person who's had a facelift or just someone from the north. But the sheep's unique looks might save his life because the sheep is thin. He wasn't planned to be bred and the farmer only intended to let him live until spring. But now the little guy is famous all over the place, internet famous. Erla thinks he might donate him to the Reykjavik Zoo. Hmm. The sheep is demanding a morning latte and daily head rubs as a part of the deal, which he deserves that. You know, Luke. Wait, so it was left on a magical mountain yeah. in Iceland. On Christmas. And it's not an actual unicorn? Yeah. Like, I think this is real. It, That's I think, how unicorns happen. Did we have right? a graphic? I think we, I need to see it. Well, either I way. I haven't seen it either. You know, I meant to mention, the, you know, during this, the pharmacy, the, the pharmacy thing is huge. I was hearing that there was one place, I think it was in Missouri, where basically to get their drugs, they would put $10,000 of cash in a briefcase. This is legal. And they would drive it over a cross state border. They would, get, they would give the $10,000 to a, a, a drug company, get the drug and then drive it back over. And that was to avoid like taxes and to avoid like blah, blah, blah. And that was real and it's happening. And like, they're, it's not illegal to do that. This is like kind of the shady so stuff. Pharmacies, pharmacies are just like driving over the state line, loading up pharmaceutical. Trunk yeah. What? Money and drugs. <laughs> it's all about money and drugs, isn't it? Yeah, it always is. It's all is. about suitcases full of bills. But you know, I, okay, this is, that's interesting because are we the only people, I think we kind of are, where we're like, to solve the problem, Advil. You know, it's like, oh, my neck hurts, Advil. Uh -huh. So it's like anything that happens to us, we're like, Oh, might as well pop an Advil. Like, I think I feel like we're the only society that really like, or you know, whatever. Well, do you culture. mean as Americans or just yes, as people in the U? Well, it may be in Canada as well because I think it's a North American thing where it's we rely so heavily on drugs. 
Like, it is interesting because other countries, you can buy extremely powerful opioid medications over mm. the counter without a prescription. True. There's a drug in France called Pontalgine, which is basically oh, yeah. caffeine and codeine <laughs> in one tap. It's an over the counter speedball. Yeah, that's fine. It's great, but yeah, but, but then why isn't that a huge? You, but you know, don't hear about you know them over having an epidemic, of, right? You don't hear about the same kind of epidemics yeah. that we have here with because they have the good bread now and croissants. Oh yeah. Oh my God. That's See, they true. have they have things to make up for. Like we just no offense, we just have a terrible life here in the U.S. And so we we'll just might as well just turn to the bottle, as they say. But oh. the bottle being Advil, <laughs> not. <laughs> but you have both bottles, you know. Don't man. Drink that's and, depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so true, though? Oh, uh, well, yeah. this was Luke Goodhart. Yes, anti Besh. Um, we're going to just head out a little early today, but thank you guys for watching. Goodbye. Stay creative, Tucson. Yeah. Dave and Buster's.